Hey everybody, it's Ben. Welcome back to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I have another amazing episode for you today. My great friend and incredible human being, Mark Coles, joins me today from his gym in Nottingham, England. Mark has been the owner of a gym called M10, a mentor to hundreds of personal trainers around the world, an incredible coach to not only clients, but also other coaches, and uh, just a guy who's actually got something of incredible value to offer to the fitness industry. There's a lot of people out there now claiming to be coaches and leaders and mentors, and no one has any real experience in the trenches getting results. They read a book and they think they're an expert. They feel inspired and they think they're an expert. Mark is somebody who not only can he talk the talk, but he has walked the walk and continues to walk the walk as he inspires so many incredible fitness professionals around the world to thrive. And ultimately, he's the one behind the scenes producing results with coaches and not only producing results from a perspective of monetary gain, but from a freedom and balance perspective, teaching you not just to accumulate more money, uh, not just to accumulate more muscle, but ultimately how to balance his three Ps, which Mark will tell you about in this podcast. Um, he gets into a lot about his background and what has led him to be this way. Um, some of our mutual mentors. And one of the things I love about this podcast is talking about giving yourself permission to think big. Mark has done an insane amount of personal development work and you know on par with some of the stuff i've done and probably exceeding me in some areas uh, he talks about some of the greatest imp influencers he's had in his life and uh, some of the pillars that he still holds on to to really make sure he's getting the most um, of every aspect of his life and he's really showing up whether it be for his wife or his friends or his family or his clients, Mark always makes sure he shows up his best. You guys are going to love this conversation. Whether or not you're in the fitness industry, this is a tremendously valuable conversation just about life and thriving in all facets. Now, one thing I want to bring up for you guys today is this conversation around protein consumption is rampant right now. And we're all told that you know the sheer numbers, the sheer math is what matters. However, at some point, we've all asked ourselves the question, well, when I eat 40 grams of protein or when I eat you know, eight ounces of steak or chicken or whatever it is, what percentage of that actually gets assimilated into the body? Considering how much we actually excrete on a day-to-day -day basis, it can't really be that much. So what are we doing, consuming, one, 1 1.5, two grams per pound, if we're only absorbing a small fraction of it, it doesn't seem to, make, seem to make a lot of sense. Yet the nutritionists out there will argue that, oh, it's just about your macros. Well, what if someone has a high versus someone having a low hydrochloric acid ratio in their stomach or a high versus a low uh, digestive enzyme count? Wouldn't that massively impact your ability to break it down? And I will tell you, the more that you eat, the more likely that your enzymatic processes are impaired. The more stressed you are, the more certain you can be that your enzymatic processes are impaired. And it's important to realize that just because you're consuming this 40 grams or 50 grams of protein without enzymes, it's going to end up in the toilet. So your intestines can only absorb what's been broken down into really small building blocks. So it needs to be broken down. That starts in the mouth with chewing and we neglect that, right? You have to expose a high degree of surface area of the food you eat to the enzymes. And then you gotta have the enzymes. So think about just sheer surface area of chewing down food. If you eat you know, and things and you're swallowing it whole, the enzymes really only get to attach or touch onto the outside of the um, food. Therefore, that's the only part that's going to be broken down. The rest of it will pass right through, often undigested and often putrefying, causing gas and uncomfortable digestion and bloating. So it's super important to make sure that you are, one, chewing, two, managing stress, and three, very importantly, if you're not supporting enzymes, I suggest you do. And this is a great segue into our sponsor for today's podcast, mass zymes. Um, ma most enzymes out there are extremely underdosed and extremely ineffective. 
it's there's an incredible video where you can shoot over to masszymes.com and watch the masszymes actually rapidly dissolve a raw steak and it's pretty phenomenal to watch uh, just what it actually does to a steak in a short amount of time and masszymes is a full spectrum amino formula uh, with a ton of protease and actually five different kinds of protease, um, you know, and a number of other enzymes to help you break down uh, all of your foods, especially proteins. So I highly suggest you guys check this out if you haven't. A huge shout out to our incredible sponsors, Bioptimizers, for giving us a discount on the episode. And if you guys want to check it out on my suggestion, head over to masszymes.com slash muscle it's m-a-s-s-z-y-m-e-s dot com slash m-u-s-c-l-e one zero muscle 10 is our code and you can try it today absolutely risk-free they give you a full money back guarantee for 365 days if you don't like the product if you don't see a benefit they will absolutely refund your money so Get over there, take advantage of your discount, and utilize it. And as I've told you before, I often utilize enzymes with meals. Certainly if I'm having a larger amount of protein or if I know maybe I'm under a little bit of stress, if you've had too much coffee or too many stimulants, you know your digestion is going to be impaired. I'm telling you that your digestion is going to be impaired. So if you're not in a very parasympathetic state, you must be taking digestive enzymes. Like it's not about how much you eat, guys. It's about your how much you absorb and assimilate. Without further rambling for me, I give you my incredible conversation with one of my great friends in the world, Mark Coles. Listen all the way to the end, guys, because you're going to love what you hear. One of my best friends in the world, one of the greatest mentors in the fitness industry, Mr. Mark Coles. Welcome to the podcast. Ben, thank you for having me. I know it's a different name, but uh, I'm back. I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you very much. Yeah, man. Um, uh, it, you're doing amazing things. You've just finished writing a book, which I was uh, privileged to be one of the first people to read. And I must say, and uh, Noble and Smoke, it was an absolutely essential read for anyone in the fitness industry, anyone who's a personal trainer. And I'll let you uh, tell us about that book and how it came to be. But first, I want to get into your journey from, uh, you know, effectively what was a personal trainer to becoming a gym owner and now on to being a mentor. And I think there's a lot of people out there who aspire to own gyms, um, you know, specifically in the fitness industry. Everyone's like, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to become a coach and I'm going to own a gym. And it seems like everyone's, uh, you know, ideal scenario. And I'd love to have you talk about that. And if you recommend it and any advice you have to anyone out there who wants to do it. Thank you very much. And before I start, Ben, I just want to say thank you for being a great friend and um, a huge support and mentor to me through my career. I don't know um, many people listening to this episode won't know that or, you know, we don't need to talk at length about our relationship, but you've been an incredible support and uh, mentor to me through my career. So thank you. Dude, I'm just here to support you as a friend. Thank you. Well, that means the world. Um, wow. So, yeah, it's been a hell of a one hell of a journey and and i guess if i can start it by saying it began very much like a lot of business owners with the idea of wanting to do something but not necessarily having the idea that this thing would necessarily be a career and a thing that provides you money and and steers you in a direction to having the things that you want in your life it's like i think i'm supposed to be here i'll do it um and the stepping stones for me from being a personal trainer was falling into the fact that that was the thing that I was truly, I knew that I was in my happy place. If I just put it like that, when I first started personal training, I just, I didn't ask any questions. I just knew I wanted to be in a gym. I knew that I would thrive in somewhere where I felt happy and what I was doing at the time, I wasn't happy mm -hmm. in a nutshell. That began probably the first step in my personal development journey. And I think anybody who is a business owner or a business person or aspiring business person listening to the podcast, it just felt right. And when I said to my dad, who was a property investor, the very successful property investor, I said, I'm working for you, dad. And I've always said to myself, if I wake up in the morning and I don't love what I do, I have to move on. And I am prepared in my life to move on as many times as it takes to find the thing that I'm enjoying and happy doing. And I just said to my dad, if I'm doing the thing that I love, I know I'll be a success. So I left university after trying to do property, a property degree in the UK. 
became a, a, initially a, started working in the property industry and then ended up working for my dad. And my dad just said to me, you know, you're not happy. And I said, I'm not. I, I, I could work for you. I could have the, the kind of silver spoon and have that passed to me and have this great career with him. But I needed to do something that was inspiring to me. And I didn't know the inspiring was a part of something that we all need to feel inspired by. But I had to go and do my own thing. So fast forward into the personal training industry, I borrowed some money, became a personal trainer. And after three or four years of being a personal trainer and training people on the gym floor, I had the opportunity to mentor young personal trainers and, and, and put them in gyms. And that was my first opportunity at kind of business because they gave me a P&L. They gave me a record of how many trainers I had to get in the gym to turn a profit for them and in turn, turn an increase in revenue for me. And I thought, wow, having more income streams meant that I could actually study more and travel more. And in turn, realizing that if I worked more, I could actually get a little bit further along. And so what I started to do initially was um, invest every bit of educate, every bit of money that I was earning from mentoring trainers very early on and my personal training business. And I started to just travel to wherever was necessary to develop my skill set. Um, and with that, opportunities came, better clients came. And I remember sitting one day, and this kind of forms a, a big part of my book, I remember sitting in, in, in the coffee shop at the gym and said, well, hold on a minute, everything that I didn't used to have, I've suddenly got a big sniff of because I'm learning more, I'm traveling more, I'm getting better clients, I'm earning more money. Perhaps this is the right way for me to grow, go to kind of build something. Um, and after four or five years, six years of being in the, in the gym, I realized that I wasn't supposed to be in the gym. So my natural step was, that I, I think I'm destined to have my own place. And he said, no, 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 I think you're not just destined to have your own place. You'll have people working for you, you have a secretary. And I was like, so, I think a lot of business owners will relate to this. I was so nervous of the jump that I was so protective over the fact that it just was going to be me and a studio. Um, and uh, sure as my dad told me in five years of owning my first studio, I had five trainers. and <laughs> We were doing, um, you know, 150, 200 sessions a week. Um, in a small 1500 square foot gym and that was the initial stepping stones that got me to owning a gym so let me st let me stop you there for a second when you made the decision to um, become a personal trainer you want to be a great personal trainer you decided that education was the path and I think yep. that's important to acknowledge because not everyone acknowledges that um, yep. some people think they're adequate they think they're good enough why did you decide between education uh, in the process rather than in the sales and marketing so Many coaches nowadays, when they try to learn how to become a better personal trainer, they're like, oh, I got to take marketing courses. I got to learn how to be better at social media. I got to, you know, so th there's always this, this um, maybe dichotomous view that people seem to have of, of do I choose to become a better salesman and marketer or do I be choose to become better at the process? And, you know, I think we know it's probably both, but it seems like you chose the beginning. Uh, I want to be better at this process. Tell me about that decision. So this actually f forms the big part of my book. Um, I have the, the one section in my book, which I'll elaborate a little bit later on later, which is called the physical, because one of the things that I realized from a young child is that I didn't really stand out. I didn't have a reputation. I wasn't very intelligent and I certainly wasn't very big. And that actually impacted my childhood, Ben. it impacted my childhood in, I didn't have a lot of friends. I wasn't very confident in myself. I didn't meet any many girls. And when I started to train and learn more about training, and able, was able to get my clients in better shape, that in itself increased my business. Simply by, by leveling up, as I call it in the book, myself and my knowledge put me in a, in a more advantageous position than anybody in my gym. I was applying myself more. I was getting better results with my clients. I was starting to get the right type of clients um, I was starting it to be able to look at each different type of client that I was working with and realizing how different they were and how different I could make their programming. And I think that initially the education side, you know, I wasn't financially focused. This is another thing to focus on. Most people in the fitness industry and most people starting business, they want to start a business, but they don't necessarily want to make money. And so my priority was filling a void that was missing in my childhood, which was I wasn't very big, I wasn't very confident, and that was the void I was filling. I, I, I didn't know anything, and I suddenly found something that I was inspired by. I wasn't very big, so I wanted to build a better body. And so 
rather than focusing on marketing, which wasn't the thing that I was in the industry for. I was in the industry because I love being in the gym, lifting weights, and then helping other people do the same. So that's why I went down that route. You know, I, there's a lot of personal trainers that think they've got to go down the marketing route, but I still believe to this day that the you know yourself, the, your body and your knowledge around the body is ultimately which will, the thing that will help you build your reputation. Yeah. You know? So you spoke about increasing your rates, and I think that's really what it is. is you went from this guy who was relatively unskilled or uneducated in the, in the space, charged a certain rate, and now continue to increase your education, your skills, and your, your personal application of it on yourself. And that gradually, uh, significantly incre increased your rates. Well, here's the thing. I, I remember going on a course, and Charles Poliquin was a great mentor of mine. He was of yours. And for those of you not listening who might want to check out who he is, the late Charles Poliquin was a world-famous strength coach and developed the Poliquin education system. And Ben, you know, you've studied under him, I've studied under him, and I'd never, ever been on a course. And I traveled, and I watched this guy, and he was big. Not very tall, but he was big. Big arms. He, he, had, he had a big energy. Oh, yeah. Oh, insane. And at the front of the class was another guy, another big guy at the time. He's not so big now, Christian Thibodeau. Yep. And I saw these two people, and there was a point. I didn't know what the word was. I, I know about it now. But they had something that everybody else didn't have. They commanded a presence. Charles was more interested in what he said. Charles was more interested in the people that were bigger. Right? And mm -hmm. Charles was more interested in the people that asked intelligent questions. Yeah. And I sat back and said nothing for the whole weekend. And I remember going in the gym and I was doing functional training at the time. And I was in there doing some functional stretches. And Christian Thibodeau cleaned a crazy amount of weight in the corner of the gym. And I went, what I'm doing is a bit rubbish, if I'm to be honest. I think that actually having something that differentiates me from everybody else is going to be quite important. So I started to work out what that was. And when I got back, it was puzzling to me, but I went, I need some way of making myself different in line with what I love. And I can articulate that now, whether I could have articulated it back then, of course not. Right. But I said, I'm going to build a body. I'm going to build my business. I Charles had talked a lot about personal development. I was already on this early stages of personal development. And I was challenging myself from, I was on the cusp of going out every weekend and filling myself with uh, naughty things at the weekends. Um, and I'm not ashamed at all to talk to anybody about my journey in my childhood and my partying and everything like that. But I was torn so much between partying and training and teaching my clients. I was in this, very unfulfilled, very unhappy place. Mm -hmm. And I went to see Charles Pollock and he introduced me to a, cu a couple of books on personal development. And suddenly I became fixated on, I can change this. I can change this. And I can change this. Mm -hmm. You can change it all. And I think cool. it's important to acknowledge that, 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 uh, that parallel line, which I think a lot of coaches have an issue with. It's like, Deciding who am I going to be, who do yeah. I have to be, or who do I want to be, and who's the client I want to train, and uh, making those things fit. Like if you know, if I'm trying to be a big muscle guy, chances are I'm going to attract more big muscle guys. If I want to, you know, if I'm going to be a functional trainer, I'm going to attract those that functional trainer, and you know, developing ultimately developing the skills that will suit the market you're trying to. Um, to appeal to. And most people, as you know, are trying to appeal to everybody, which is just a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. um, so really zeroing in on what, as you say, gets you excited about it, uh, gets you enthusiastic about it, and then learning those skills. Well, I'm not going to tell anybody to be as dedicated as, as I was to body transformations, physiques, and my own level of bodybuilding. I'm not going to tell anyone. If you love, my advice to anybody is if you, if you love your industry, and you love functional training or CrossFit or whatever you do, do it. Yeah. But as you said on our podcast a while ago, do it five times better. At least. At least, right? Do it multiple, multiple times better. So I said to myself, oh, 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 now, we've got a, now we've got a destination to get to. I want to build a – and I said to myself, this was vision planning, and I didn't even know it was vision planning. I said, I've got to stand out in this gym. So I wrote down a list of things that had to happen. I had to have better results than anybody else in the gym. I certainly had to be charging more than everybody else in this gym. And there was only one way to get a significant difference to stand out in front of the trainers. And the badges that we had were different colors. And this, the, the more 
knowledgeable courses. The more courses you'd done, the more you could charge. And the more that you could charge, the different color your label was. And I said, there we go. I want to be purple while they're blue. I want to be yellow while they're white. And I made sure that my logo, my, my uh, had a chart on the wall that t- said my name and my qualifications and stuff. And it was weight management, core conditioning <laughs> at the time. Uh, but at the top, I was a different color because I'd done more certifications and they were all done in two years. And I was charging 45 an hour and they were charging 30. And I'd got that differentiation. And then what started to happen was people would come in the gym and say, who's the guy that's the different color? I want to meet him. They did. Yeah. And I was like, that's me. And they would go, great, I want to work with you. And I went, okay. So they clearly want the different one. And then I suddenly got people coming in and saying, I want to work with you. Then I got the right, started to get the right type of clients. The clients were prepared to, to do the work. And this started a kind of trend. And I thought, well, if I want better people, more money, more recognition, better reputation, I just keep doubling up on what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. So then I, what I started doing was setting the, setting the level of – I was reading um, – I actually just finished a course with John DiMartini. And he said that one of the things he did – and I didn't realize I did this, but I put on a list of paper the people that I wanted to meet. And believe it or not, you were one of them. Oh, wow. Thank you, man. Okay. And I said, that dude's never going to speak to me. I was 90 kilos. Right. That guy's not going to speak to me. Charles Poliquin said the same thing. You want to get in front of the people, make sure you make them notice you. And I remember going to seminars with Charles Poliquin. I remember going to uh, workshops, hypertrophy workshops. And do you remember when you did his, the video in his gym in Rhode Island where you measured your bicep? Yeah. Okay. We all watched that. And I was like, damn, how do you get to meet that guy? And this, th- th- this was just important because I was like, if you want to keep stepping up, stepping stones, how do we get closer to some of these people? How do we learn from these people? So I just kept going on courses and I kept meeting different people. And then short as eggs or eggs, I ended up meeting the people that I wanted to meet. And it, that, from a personal training perspective, I, know, I don't want to sound this in an arrogant way, but I watched what everybody else wasn't doing and I was watching what everybody else was doing. And I'll tell you, there's somebody in the fitness industry you, you and I both know but at the time, Nick Mitchell still is doing an incredible job in the fitness industry with his business. Mm-hmm. Um, and he had the biggest reputation in, in London for body transformations. And I looked at Nick and I was like, he's got a great reputation, mm-hmm. but not many other people have. And I want to be a reputation in this country for body transformations. So I took it upon myself to get the level of results where people said, oh, wow. Right. You know, so... There's something to be to be said there with your list of people you want to meet, man. I think that's massive. I think it's important that people strive for that. And I, I frame my life around that, right? I think I've told you about my my idea of the proverbial table, like who sits at that table that um, you know I mean, you know, the, my ideal group of people that I want to be with yeah. or be around. Yeah. Um, but it's not the type of table where I, I'm, um, you know, I'm just showing up and uninvited. Yeah. But I, I'm a welcome invited guest. Um, and something that, that stands out to me that I think is important for the listener to maybe acknowledge is a lot of the times your foot in the door is often a pay-to-play scenario, right? So when you hired me for that consult, Charles actually hired me as well the first time we met for those videos, ironically. He calls me. He goes, hey, how much for a day of filming? I go, this. He goes, okay, I'm flying you down next week. I was like, okay. And we became great friends. And sometimes with people who are very busy like yourself, if someone just calls you and goes, Mark, you, you know, you're one of the people that I really want to meet – Sometimes it's very hard and, and not no fault of anyone, just like it's very hard to fit people in the schedule. Um, so going out and hiring a coach, going out and hiring a mentor, uh, hiring a consult may be the best way for you to start getting your foot in the door. And then you say when you're there, it's like, oh, you show them you have something of value. You show them what you've built. You show them this physique. You show them this business. That's ultimately how you and I became friends, right? It was like, mm-hmm. man, this guy's bringing more value to the table than I am. I think this is this is a person that I want to hang around with. So you, know, you kind of got your foot in the door or, or someone gets their foot in the door and then you get there and you present Hey, here's the work I've been putting in every single day for the last ten years, you know. And then that that's usually often a good way in, in this day and age. Because man, as you know, on a daily basis, hundreds of people want your time and attention. So it's very hard to start standing there waving the flag, going, "Hey, please come hang out with me. Look at me." So, um, you know, that idea of showing that you're invested. Because I get people every day who say, "Ben, I want to work for you." 
I said, okay, how many of my classes have you done? None. How many of my camps have you attended? None. How have you done my mentorship? No. Well, how? Like, how am I going to know you're the person to hire? So I think that that's important for people to acknowledge who are listening, who want to be great coaches, who want to meet those people. Um, you know, man, like, you got to show you're, you're invested, right? Well, make, make yourself somebody that they would want to invite to that table. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you know, I go back to this whole thing with Nick. I remember being on seminars and Nick was talking, Charles, I was sitting at the back and I was like, damn, he obviously rates this guy. And then a year later, Nick and I were in Scottsdale, Arizona, sat on the same sun lounger next to each other talking about business. And I'm like, you know, you end up there. Right. And, and at that time, it was, an, you know, he was you know, very inspirational with what he was doing with his business that then still is to this day. And then I turn up and I, I think I told you this, but Thursday before you were speaking at the ISSN conference in, in Florida, um, it was on the Thursday. I think you were speaking on the Saturday. I, I, I saw the last notice online and said, sorry, I'll book a flight. And I got there and I put my hand up at the front. I asked you if we you know, go for breakfast and you didn't know me. I didn't know you. And I thought, I just just need to just meet the guy because this just just something I know I would get from you and little did we know it was going to be a friendship, but that's not, that's not just you. It, and then same thing with you. It's happened to so many people, but I had to say to myself, if you want to sit at a table or, or, or get in front of people, build something that's worth notably, you know, uh, recognizable in their field. So I didn't have to build a, you know, a body in this industry was obviously important, but if you have something of credibility or something of recognition, it'll get you damn sight closer. Right, but you understand, man, that your your judgments of people are made unconsciously before they ever open their in their mouth, and, and it's so important that you know you showed up looking the way you did, dressed the way you did, carrying yourself the way you did. I knew that you were someone unconsciously. I knew you were someone that was to be respected, right? And that, that's important to acknowledge. Is you know, it's the way someone carries himself matters. And knowing that you bring something to the conversation at an unconscious level matters, right? So you have to accomplish these micro goals on a day-to-day basis, which you clearly did, to become the type of person that's bringing something of value at an unconscious level, right? You, you can turn on the big external egocentric uh, swagger at any time, but it's all a facade. And anyone who knows anything can sees through it. So mm-hmm. if you're someone who's accomplished a great deal of things in your life, you just naturally carry this um, air of confidence. It's not arrogance, it's confidence. And, I, and I, I cover this a lot in the book. You know, at the end of the day, if you make very little attempts to level up, then it's going to take you a long time to get to where you want to get to. Because for every little bit that you level up, you bring more confidence. Yeah. If you just, for me, everything that I've talked about, it's never, I'm never challenging anybody else. I'm never competing against anybody else. I just know that if I want to get a bit further and, and get in front of other people or have a bigger business or have more income, every upward step that I've taken it's been rewarded, you know, it, it, it's, it's come back, you know, so. I see my little people trying to sneak in the room. Are they? <laughs> come here, Brass. Can you come say hi to Mr. Mark? Uh-huh. Who is it? Who is this? Do you remember me? Hold on, remember Mr. Mark? Let me take my audio. Up. Now then, my friend. Now then, my friend. Hello. Hello. Mr. Mark. You're probably do you remember me? Friend. Yes, you do. Look. Oh. Do you remember me? You got the two munchies. Look at you. Hello. Hi. Do you remember, Mr. Hi. Do you remember me? Yes. I don't. Pressy, you yes, remember you me. Do. You got to remember Mr. Mark. Yes, you do. No. Oh. Yes, you do now. Uh, you guys can't make your own mac and cheese. <laughs> you can try. What? Okay. We know how, Daddy. You're going to burn yourself with this boiled, though. No, Daddy. No. You're going to do it? Okay, we know man. how. <laughs> I feel like I might be a bad parent for letting this happen. But... Can you close the door here, guys? Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Um, anyways, man, I don't know where we were on that. I see them trying to sneak in the door. It's okay. Um, where were so, we? Yeah, I don't know. Distracted. We'll, we'll do a little edit job. Um it's every step every step you take in is a step up toward yeah 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 um so one thing that actually this this awareness came to me last night and i think it's it's maybe a useful one for anyone and maybe one that we can apply to our coaching is every day in life i'm envisioning um 
you know, in, in it's almost like clouds floating by. There, there's different things that float by in your life. There's different events, different opportunities, and just picture them like clouds floating by, and you get to choose which um, things you pull into your life. So, you know, it's, the, it's this idea of, of options, right? You have choices to make on a day-to-day -day basis. And it, you just imagine them like floating by in the sky. You can go, there's a hard one. That's an, op that's an obstacle, that's an opportunity, that's a challenge. I'm gonna pull that one and I'm gonna do that one. Or I can let everything float by and I can just go ahead and do nothing throughout the day. But at some point, it's still a decision. So I'm making a decision to either do the things that are gonna make me grow. I'm gonna read the book, I'm gonna go for the walk, I'm gonna do the workout, I'm gonna you know, have the hard conversation. And those things make me better. The people who choose the, the bigger things, the bigger obstacles out of the sky on a more consistent basis, develop the character, develop the characteristics, the traits to ultimately be, become the most successful person. The people who decide on a day-to-day -day basis, like, ah, uh, I didn't really feel up to it today. I think I'm gonna let those challenges keep going by. Unfortunately, you're not gonna progress. And I think that's a really easy uh, metaphor. Um, not quite nailed down yet, but that's, you know, the way I'm picturing it. it's like, you just have these opportunities that float by. An example being, I can choose to drive to the store. I can choose to walk to the store. I can choose to read the book. I can choose to watch TV. And all these things just keep coming up in life. What's number to put it on? In For the heat? Yeah. No, to boil it. Yeah, no, on high. Um, yeah. Put the lid on, sweetheart. Um, so yeah, that, that's a simple way to think about it, right? Is like, are you going to do, like, are you going to eat the, the food that maybe takes a little bit longer, that's, uh, you know, healthy for you? You're going to eat the thing that's quick and convenient and tastes good. And, you know, always have those decisions. And the people who make the, the decision that allows personal growth and discipline and development, uh, they're going to win. They're going to win at life. But it has to be something that you're conscious of every single day. And I think you did it because, you know, thinking about your decision to make, to, to build that gym, that was hard. That was like, man, I know this is going to be a huge obstacle. But yet you still stood there and said, I got it. I can handle this. Something in your life up to that point allowed you to have confidence in your ability to, to take on that big chunk. Cause that's a big, that's a big one floating through the sky, right? A little one may be like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to read this book today. Whereas a big one's like, I'm going to open this massive business. Now you've taken the dive and this is kind of where I want to transition this. Now you've taken the dive from, um, well, so let's, let's just reverse a little bit. You've, you went from, um, now I'm, I'm coaching, uh, or, or I'm, I have you know eight f five to eight people working under me. Now I've got a now I want to open a gym. There's a lot of people out there um, who want to understand what that process looks like. And so you went from opening a 1,500 square foot studio to then owning I think is what is a is a 10,000 square foot or, or thereabout uh, full size gym. How? Why? Well, here's the thing, and you just said about this kind of like picking off certain things. I truly believe that you've got to do, you've got to take small wins and allow that momentum to turn you into a machine. And it is small wins that give you the confidence to take the big challenges on. And I think that the vision is the first thing for me. I started off and said to myself, I wanted to be the best known trainer in my town. And I wanted to be the best known trainer in my city. And we talk about playing a bigger game, right? I played a local game, had a local following, and had a local income. I started to play a regional game and started to get a regional income and started to get a regional following. And I thought, if I could start playing that type of game, could I start to play bigger? And my father, I am so privileged to have such an entrepreneurial person in my life, but I just watched him doing more. Now, here's the thing. This is what it was. Mentoring. Having people in my life that gave me the permission when I wasn't strong enough to go again and to go again. And in the book, I talk at length about the physical. My body taught me something, Ben, that I never dreamed was possible. Not even the first gym. The first gym I took on board. But I never thought I could fill my diary as a PT. I never thought that I could build a physique. And then I was just like, if all these little wins are keep happening, just keep setting the bar higher. So I opened up the first studio, filled that up. And here's the thing. The first studio was 1,500 square foot. And I said to Charles Poliquin in a cons consult one day, how many trainers should I get in that facility? He said five. And I went, for 1,500 square foot? And he went, hell yeah, it's personal training. You need this amount of space? Fill it. So I filled it. <laughs> And Charles Poliquin said, your diary, when your diary is full, you put your prices up. When you have a waiting list, you put your price up. So I did that. It was incremental steps. 
that, that basically kept giving me the confidence. I think there's a lot of business people that aren't doing that. You know, they're not giving themselves these micro targets. So what gave you, uh, what, what process did you use to get more people in the door? So in terms of the gym itself, um, I had a, I had 50 clients a week um, at that initial time. And my diary got busier and busier. And, and, and it was all. This is you thing. personally did 50 a week? I was doing. I did fifty a week out of my own studio. Those are one hours, two hours, or one hour one sessions, hour? Oh. one hour sessions. Yeah. So I was charging fifty pounds an hour at the time, UK pounds. I was doing fifty sessions. I got overwhelmed. I couldn't. I couldn't do any more. And at that point, somebody advised me to just bring somebody on to help you. So I reached out to a, a young coach who'd actually been asking for my advice. Um, I said, look, do you want to work here? I'll give you a percentage that, you know, of, of the income. I've got a waiting list of about 20 people. So you have 20 clients, 20 sessions, 25 sessions a week straight away. He brought his clients in. And suddenly the snowball happened because I started training him, teaching him. And then his clients and my clients, we, we, ben, we didn't have social media. I wrote, this is what I did a post about this the other day. I didn't have social media. And I got to five trainers by writing a column in a local magazine. Five trainers, nearly 200 sessions a week on reputation. We couldn't present our results on social media. There was a local farming magazine, and I had flyers on the local health shop table. So this might sound, oh, yeah, but Mark, make it relative to today. Of course I will, right? But um, my point is we were freaking good at what we did. Mm -hmm. And everyone in the town, doesn't matter where you went, it was like you want to train with those guys. And, and I think today that's lost in business. 100 I think that, I have to say, I'm sorry, but the whole thing about Level Up was born out of, I, I, I get shivers down my spine now, just be better and better and better and better, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and your, your marketing will be done for the people around you. Now, globally, it's different, but you've still got your MI40 crew that talk about you all the time. Dude, I don't, I don't think globally is different, Mark. So here's the thing, and you and I are very much in alignment on this, is when I started, I didn't want to be the biggest guy in my gym. I didn't want to be the biggest guy in my town, my city, or my country. I want to be the biggest guy in the world. Yep. And if someone sets out to have that standard to begin with, I don't think it's any different. I think it's just holding yourself to a different standard. So you know, identifying that massive goal that you want uh, in the beginning, and you know, had you done that, you know, would it be, have been different? Would it have been bigger? Probably, right? Like, and and I think having the confidence to to aim high is a big lesson to be learned here for coaches. Is like if you actually want. Now, I will say, be careful what you wish for, because right? Like, oh, I want to be, I want to be as famous as The Rock. Mm, do you? <laughs> like, be careful, right? Uh, you know, it has its blessings and its curses. Um, so I think you know, ha even if you decide right now, like, hey man, I want to have the biggest gym in the world. I have no shadow shadow of a doubt in my mind that in five years you'd have the biggest gym in the world because you're someone who no matter what you do, you set your goal to it and you just move toward it. Mm -hmm. I think that's what, what hopefully people start to acknowledge is it starts with little wins and big visions. I think, and you're so right. And that's something that I, I, I teach a hell of a lot of today. The vision has to be there. You have to give yourself permission to think big. Yes, uh, with it, okay? I'll be out in just a few minutes. <laughs> so Please you are open, baby, so I can hear what you guys are doing. I want to see if you... <laughs> Dude, if you could see what they're doing right now. <laughs> just... Can you make as much mess as you possibly can? As long as you can make as much mess as possible. <laughs> he's standing on the counter, doing something on top of the fridge. What the hell are you doing? Oh, he's... <laughs> I wish I had my phone. I'd take a picture. Uh, he's standing on the counter. I don't know what the hell he's doing. He's making a there you go. <laughs> yeah, he's doing a great job. Just make a bit more mess, Mesh Presley. Mark, Mark says just make a little more mess. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, but just make some more. No messes. No messes. Okay, I love you guys. Give me a few minutes, okay? That's hilarious. Be careful. We will. You have to make a turkey, a little menace to the society. Legends. Uh, man, I think this stuff's important. I'm just, the hot water kind of scares me a little bit, but everything else, I'm like, hey, you guys are right. He knows not to use the big knives. Like, he's good. Yeah, it's, it's character building. 100%. Just, but water is one of those. I always, yeah, yeah, my, yeah. My, 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 my line in the sand is, are we going to the hospital or not? As long yeah. as we're not going to the hospital, we're good.
Yep, yeah. yeah, they can do whatever they want. But as long as we're, yeah. if we're going to the hospital, I'm like, all right, I got to kind of step in here. I think that's that's fair. That's a yeah. boundary. It's a good boundary. Yeah. Um, sorry, man. Keep keep getting. Distracted. No, 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 no. It's good. Um. So, Mark, lead us off and send us down the path about your book. So, you went from personal trainer, extremely successful gym owner, mentoring a lot of coaches, teaching a lot of coaches. So, you were teaching courses around the world, and now you've shifted to mentoring uh, some of the top coaches in the world. And now you've decided, hey, you know what? I've got so much great information here, and I've got such a great perspective that I'm going to write a book. Okay. So, for the last five years, there's been – an internal pressure, not an external pressure. You know, I don't, I don't fall into that. I must, I should, you know, um, something that, um, (laughs) something that I wanted to do. Um, and one of the, one of the things that I was saying to myself is I want at some point to leave something in the industry, um, make a, make a, Difference on a bigger scale. And I was challenged whether or not that was a an individual educational resource, like nutrition, but, you know, whatever it would be. And I remember being in uh, Abu Dhabi speaking at an event, and uh, a gentleman that I was with, very, very, very successful gentleman in Abu Dhabi who who'd paid to, to have me out there. And he watched me speak for a couple of days, and he was – just ended up having a conversation with me one day and I, I, I felt this kind of mentoring energy around me. He's a very successful gentleman. And I said, do you mind if I ask you a question? I said, you've seen me speak for two days. And this might seem a random question, but why do you think I haven't written a book? <laughs> and he goes, I can tell you why you haven't written a book. Because you want to write a legacy book. It was the most bizarre but perfect conversation I've had in my career. And I got on a plane and I went, yeah, it's a legacy book. I'm not done yet. Now, I'm not done now. But I tell you what, I've got the framework of where I'm at right now and how valuable that can be to somebody who wants to, to progress their career. So I spent a lot of time in my head, and Level Up's always been something that's that's been a huge thing to me. And I broke it down, and I said, Do you know what? Now's the time. This was four or five years ago, and I had this kind of idea of wanting to do something. And I went, now is the time. And my business model focuses on three things, personal, physical, professional, building your mindset, um, personal growth journey. I, I, mindset to me is, is very isolated. You know, people can say mindset in terms of motivation. Um, I would say mindset for me is mastering your emotions, being in control, just being in control, like not being – phased by other people, going on your own path, being happy. That's a big thing for me. I've been very unhappy. I've been trying to be multiple different people throughout my life until I met my wife four years ago. That was the, that was the pinnacle of the word happiness for me. But I'd, I'd been searching for that nugget, and that nugget just dropped straight in. Um, and level up is mastering myself, mastering yourself. How to be happy, how to be in control, and how to create an inspired vision for yourself that makes you wake up with energy like you've never felt before. Getting torn out of bed, right? Oh. Rather than struggling to get out of bed, it's, it's, it's something pulling you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that's the, for the personal development bit for me. The physical is how much we underestimate the value of our body of being a gift and what we can learn from it. I have not mastered it, and I don't attempt to master it. But I will do all I can. I think how, how you've done it, as have I. I've used my body to master my mind. And I think yes. both of us maybe had uh, struggles as children and to develop that confidence and, and all of the amazing assets and attributes in your mind, you used your body as the vehicle. And I think that's what most people are in this fitness industry are presented with as an opportunity. Uh, we can we can use the daily challenges, the daily obstacles, the daily discipline built into a workout to develop our confidence, character. And do, do, you know, do you know I see a lot of people saying, you know, bodybuilding or building your physique or getting very, very lean is very damaging. Well, not if you're in control. Mm-mm. And I think that someone said to me the other day, what do you think to alcohol? And I said, in the wrong hands, it's dangerous, just like bodybuilding in the wrong hands is dangerous, just like mm-hmm. earning, earning too much money is dangerous. The thing that defines what you do with it is this. 
if you're in control of this, you're in control. If you get very lean, you're in control of the reverse diet. If you're not in control of the reverse diet, you go off on a different tangent. And, and bodybuilding can be your greatest gift. And I realized this well after retirement, maybe maybe before retirement, but bodybuilding becomes a gift when you embrace the process and enjoy in the process. When you're attached to the outcome, you're, you are only a victim to every day, right? You can only ever be a victim to that end result because you're never going to achieve it. There's, there's never a result that's good enough. Whereas if you are the owner of the process, the, the person who's taking control every day and, and developing all those attributes, that's when bodybuilding may be the greatest opportunity or certainly one of them that exists in the world. And I, I didn't realize that until after, well into my career. And, and you, you saying that is so important because I don't know everything in marketing. Far from it. I don't know everything in building my physique. I don't know everything in coaching. I certainly don't know everything in personal development and wealth, wealth mastery or finance. But I never stop moving forward. And if I keep learning and I keep associating myself with the right people, and if I keep giving myself goals, visions, and dreams that are aligned with what I want or where I want to be, I can go as far as I freaking want. But as you said, I don't get attached to I have to make a certain something it's it's a stepping stone and it's a journey it's a process yeah so how do you balance the education necessary as a coach and business owner uh now whereas i you know in the beginning you said i want to be a better i want to be a better coach i want to understand how to do this stuff better now as a business owner it's there's so much that you need to do to achieve that vision it's, it's i have to build my body i have to maintain my relationships i have to understand finances i have to understand marketing i have to understand the pro, better at the process and then and then i have to make it all these things that i do unconsciously i have to now do them consciously because now i have to teach them right so teaching something to someone like if I, you and i walk in a gym i can get results for any human being on the planet yeah. no question yeah. Yeah. but now how do i take all that stuff out of my brain that i do unconsciously and teach it to someone that's a whole different thing so how do you personally attempt to balance the ascension through all of the the acquisition of all these variables well first things first you have to know what got you to where you were so for me the first thing i've done over the years is i put everything into frameworks everything into structure everything into systems everything into processes i have an incredible team around me but you know one of the things that i've done the one of the greatest blessings for me has been the gym because i have a team of coaches and those team of coaches are delivering at a center of excellence, what we call for personal training in the UK. We're delivering every single day and we're watching and refining it every single day. Um, and all I do with each individual component of what we want to teach is break it down into a framework because everything's got its own journey that we've gone through. And then obviously for me now is also realizing that there are aspects that there are other people within my business that are actually probably way better than me. At certain aspects and I stay true now to the where I'm needed the most and then bring alongside people to learn the systems and then me teach them the individual systems themselves so to answer your question how do we take everything that we've done so skillfully with other people to me it was a natural tr um, transition because I've always been a teacher and I think that's where a lot of people kind of miss up is, is that they've never educated they've never taught especially coaches They've trained people but never coached. Um, and then to me, it was hiring other people and taking those people through the system because when it came to teaching other people, I'd always be, already been doing that with my team. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. I, I'd, I'd always, always been doing it for my team. But to, to go back to what you said, for me, it's I, I listen to a lot of people talk about what they know and it doesn't come across in a way that's valuable to other people because they haven't been able to put it into a system and a framework. And so what I've done, especially with my three Ps, my level up process for somebody is to identify your, yourself as a person, as a professional, and in the physical body, and look at where best is the next step for you to go and which part of the framework you need to be a part of. And I think in anybody that's got a business, if there isn't a structured process to go from A to B to C, then it becomes even more confusing for the person hiring you to go through the process because you're putting them in, in at the wrong place. Right. So you put all of your coaches that work for you through the three P process. So here's the thing: like the um, we, all our personal trainers at the gym will go through very much the physical process as a personal trainer. Then then Dan and I will actually spend more of the time on the personal aspect. I, every single one of the personal trainers are growing as people. 
and are having their personal growth and develop challenged as well. That's great. I genuinely don't believe that there is... I genuinely don't believe in the education system um, in the industry that there are many people that take on board the personal aspect. The, um, the personal development aspect of someone's journey can often become their blocker of applying the physical and their blocker of applying the business because the personal stops them being able to see and believe and achieve. So for me, if you avoid the personal, whether it's in business, if you own um, a car company, car sales company, if you own a sales company, if you own a personal training company, I think that personal growth and development and actually understanding the values of the people that work for you and understand that people who are working for you do not they're not there to make you successful or wealthy. They're there to go on their own journey. And I'll tell you this. I've owned M10 now for uh, 12, 13 years. And one of the biggest mistakes I ever made in my career was thinking that people should work for me and they should be proud to work for me. My biggest lesson, it was I walk in the gym and I'd see everybody. I was like, do this, do that, do this, do that, rule, rule with an iron fist. And then I started to understand that this was a learning curve. <sighs> Huge learning curve for me. And I and I, I failed here. I failed here. It, but it was a valuable lesson I needed to learn. So the failure was not in a way of, oh, my God, I failed. I'm such a bad person. But at the time, it was a valuable lesson when one that I needed was I had a load of trainers leave me at one time. Right? And they left. And I it was costing me about 2500 a week, 3000 a week out of my pocket. Right? And I stopped and I had to readdress how I looked after people, leadership. And uh, I fell on into a course and study and had another mentor. And the advice was, these people aren't with you to grow your business. They never will be. They will remain loyal and trustworthy within the brand so long as they're achieving the thing that's most inspiring to them in their life. So if it's family that they want, if it's earning enough money to be able to look after the family and move forward in the direction they want to move forward, they'll be inspired. They'll do everything they possibly can to help your business grow. They'll do everything in their power. If at any point their values are not being met and they feel like unfulfilled, they will subconsciously not do everything that you need to help to grow your business. So I started to make a conscious decision to listen and learn to every individual that I got working in the facility to the point where they knew that I was interested in them, listening to them, and helping them move in the direction they wanted to get to. There will be a ceiling within every business where people can't grow to where they want to grow, and naturally they may move on. But so long as I can provide a career path and a direction and a moving forward process for people that fulfills them and equals the things that they're most inspired by, they will always give me what they need. And I probably have right now have the best team that I've ever, ever had at M10, um, and I'm so proud of them, and they're great people. And guess what? I've got the best relationship with my team that I've ever, ever had. But it's brilliant. Is there a book you recommend on that? Because that, that would be something that I think everyone should learn. Because what you just said there is like, and I, I hear it like if, if I think now on all my individual team members, they tend to emphasize on particular things. So I have people that work for me who, who really value education. I have people who work for me who really value money and security. I, I value people who value mentorship. Um, but everyone kind of values different things. And I've never consciously maybe other than from you never consciously actually heard that stuff well they um the interesting thing is um one of my team members uh, as time goes by um i started to notice was more inspired by money but they weren't anymore i can just see it you you genuinely you know when you look at people what people value it's around them they're talking about it they want to talk about it and you can see it and i never really watched for this and some of the guys that are let's say you're relatively new to m10 you're inspired by learning and you're inspired by getting results. Money's not a massive thing. In the early days for me, Ben was Ben, money wasn't a massive thing. So as I was getting results and I was getting bigger and I was getting leaner, I felt amazing about myself, all I cared about. And do you know what highest on my values was bodybuilding, food, and clients. Done. That's all I cared about. But do you know what? So long as I had all those things, I was happy. Then it shifted. Now here's the funny thing. I realigned my value six weeks ago. Do you know training? Training has appeared now number eight in my values. Eight. Right? This was insane. Is that all through Martini's values? Yes. Yes. So 
Uh, that's funny. People ask me that all the time. Like, how, you know, where is that? And I'm like, it's it's pretty far down the list. So, so here's the thing. And I had to deal with this about six months ago because yeah. I spoke to my coach and I said to my personal development coach, i got a bit of an issue. Um, I feel I should be doing two-hour sessions like I used to do. And she was like, what do you mean should? I was like, yeah, because I should. Like, that's what we still do. But she said, hey, hey, are you still in shape? I was like, yep. She goes, are you still training hard? I went, yep. She was, you're just finding a more efficient way to get it done. That, that allows you that extra hour and extra half an hour to continue working on your business, which is your highest value. And I was like, yes, that's exactly what I'm doing. Then the other thing was funny. I used to want to put my wife number one on my values. And now my wife's number six. And she and I said, oh my God, that's terrible. And she went, no, it just means you've got perfectly independent lives because you're not shadowing over each other. You're not all over each other. And I was like, well, that's true because she does her thing. I do my thing. And if she was in my face all the time, I won't be able to grow my business. So the funny thing is, is they've sh- my, my values have shifted so much. And this is funny. When you have people working for you, within every three or four months, theirs may shift. And so I have to constantly be spending time talking to them, giving them a phone call, listening to them, watching their kind of movements to ensure that the conversations we have are around them growing as individuals and ensuring that the business is giving them what they want. And if it isn't, how can we actually navigate the business to ensure that they get what they want? Because that's when you will get your most loyalty and trust from your staff. Man, that's maybe the best piece of advice that any business owner is ever going to receive, and I'm going to take it and apply it. So uh, thank you, man. Uh, I don't want to take too much of your time. I want you to tell everyone where they can get your book and where they can find out more about working with you personally. Thank you. Um, so my Instagram, you can hear all of it, you know, follow me, which is you Mark have, You have an amazing content. Instagram, by the way. Like a really good – you do a really good job. And, and the quotes you use and the videos you use are, are – Amazing. So I suggest Thank everyone you. follow. Yeah. So it's that smart calls M10, uh, M10. And then I have m10life.com, uh, which will, uh, by the end of this week, have m10life.com forward slash level up, which is what the book will be. And there's a resources section as well in there. Um, and uh, you, you'll see everything of mine on there and the book. And the book can be purchased from Amazon.co.uk if you're in the UK or .com overseas. Um, and that will be released on August the 3rd, which is my birthday, which is why I delayed it a little bit. Um, That's very so, good. I like so it's, it. it's, it's working out very nicely that it's my birthday. Um, and uh, Ben, I'm, I'm very grateful that you've had me on here. Thank you. And like I said, I was truly privileged to be one of the first people to read that book. And I think I was three or four chapters in and I was just didn't want to put it down. I was like, this is so good. This is exactly what. So as I hire coaches into my business, this is exactly what they need. Like they need to read this and understand the balance because you realize as a coach, your ability to get results is only as good as your ability to, to believe in yourself. Like if I don't have the confidence in myself, no one's going to hire me because they're, they're going to—they don't want to follow someone who's not even at their level or or someone who's uh, they aspire to be like. Mm-hmm. So all the, this balance of of the personal, the physical, and the professional is exactly what every coach out there needs, man. So thank and, you. And and you were kind enough to do the forward, so that's worth the read in itself. Hey, man, so thank I, you. Right, I think it was it was truly an honor. Thank you, man. Thank, thank you. Mark. And that's a wrap, ladies and gents. Thank you very much for tuning in to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I feel incredibly blessed to connect with the guests that I do, to be able to connect with the listeners as we do in the muscle intelligence community and on social media. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your ear. It doesn't go lightly. And I I super, I am super grateful for your time and for you being here and giving me your trust in first sourcing incredible guests, vetting the guests, and then ultimately vetting the information and asking the best possible questions to get you results. Now, this podcast is really truly framed around delivering the knowledge, the skill set to empower you to live your greatest life in a body you love. And what that means is any situation that arises for you, you have the tool belt to be able to snap your fingers and adapt and become anti-fragile to any type of stress that exists. So if it's a, it, a, an environmental stress, if it's a circumstantial stress, if it's a training stress, if it's a relationship stress, ultimately mm-hmm. learning how to become adaptive and not allowing external forces to change who you are on the inside. That's what this is about to me is I hated being a victim to my environment or to my relationship or to my financial circumstance. And I committed to never being a victim in my life. And to not be a victim, you must learn skills. You must learn to be one, be present and be mindful so that you can start paying attention to the way you're responding. And two, being able to have a diverse enough skill set 
to apply to any situation that's thrown at you. And that's the goal of this podcast. So whether it's like, hey, I just want to put on 20 pounds of muscle, easy. Hey, I want to learn 20 pounds of, lose 20 pounds of fat, done. Hey, I want to have a successful relationship, know how to do that. Hey, I want to love myself. I want to have a great, happy smile in my heart every single day when I wake up. Great. I want to be a great parent. Great. I want to be a great son, daughter, you name your avatar. We have the skill set to do it. And we are building that every single day. So thank you guys for joining me in this incredible mission to empower you and ultimately empower the entire world with the knowledge and skill set to live their greatest life in the body they love. I appreciate you being here. And one more shout out to our show sponsor, Masszymes. Uh, you can head over to masszymes.com slash muscle 10 and get 10% off. And as I said in the intro to this podcast, if you're not already taking enzymes, you are absolutely sending your high quality expensive protein down the toilet, especially if you're consuming uh, anything more than 0.5 to 0.75 grams per pound. Your body is going to have a hard time digesting that. If you're in a stress state, it's going to be inhibited. So I highly suggest you stop wasting your money on expensive meat without using enzymes with it. And Masszymes is by far the highest potency and highest quality enzymes that could exist on the market. And you guys can check that at masszymes.com and watch their incredible video of, of the enzymes dissolving a steak. And if you don't feel how Masszymes help you upgrade your digestion and power through your food, the support team will give you a no questions asked refund. So and that's for 365 days. So how is that for an ironclad guarantee, guys? So head over to masszymes.com, use the code MUSCLE10, get hooked up, and let me know how it goes. As always, I want to hear from you guys. So have a wonderful day. Thank you all for being here. And we'll see you on the next episode of the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Mikulski. Thank you so much for tuning in to Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Mikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.